Welcome back to the Genetic Genius Podcast, where we explore the latest breakthroughs in genetics and how they're impacting our health and well being. I'm your host, Dr. Lulu, and this week we have a very special guest, Dr. Jim Roche, America's healer. Dr. Roach is a renowned expert in integrative medicine, and today we'll be discussing his latest book, Brilliance, The Pursuit of Hope, Wisdom, and the Divine. In this episode, we'll be diving into the world of nutrients and botanicals and exploring how they can help promote optimal health and wellness. Dr. Jim Roach is a leading expert in integrative medicine, specializing in nutrition, botanical medicine, functional medicine, spirituality, integrative health, genetics, and holistic medicine. He's the author of several highly regarded books, including Brilliance, The Pursuit of Hope, Wisdom, and the Divine, which has received glowing reviews from experts in the field of integrative medicine. He is one of the world's leading integrative medicine experts, America's top botanical physician, a national speaker, international consultant, and wildly sought clinician with patients from across the country. With over 100 interviews on radio and TV, he is a highly regarded thought leader in the field. So sit back, relax, and get ready to explore the bounty and beauty of nature with Dr. Jim Roach. And today we are joined by Dr. Jim Roach. And today we're going to be discussing how botanicals and nutrients can help to promote brain growth, improve overall health, and even unlock transformative spiritual experiences. So welcome, Dr. Roach. Thanks for inviting me. I greatly appreciate being on your show. You're so welcome. Before we dive into all those great topics, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself to the audience so they can get to know you a little bit better and find out your story, your background, your inspiration to where you are now. Sure. Yeah. So I did 20 years of conventional family medicine, but around 2000, I wanted to see how long I could live. I was approaching 50 and I wanted to see how well I could live. So I started studying as much as I could, reading as many medical journals. Then uh, two or three years later, I joined Andrew Wiles, a nutrition and health conference. Then he had a conference in New York at Columbia on botanicals. And I didn't know why I would want to go to that, my, but my intuition said go. I wasn't <laughs> in the city. Then Medicines from the Earth Conference, a year later, I heard about Donnie Yance, went down there, and he's had a major influence on my life. I've been out to Ashland, Oregon three times studying under Donnie Yance. So botanicals are really my favorite avenue of treatment and managing my patients. And I've been to nearly 50 national conferences now, and I'm associated with drug companies, and I've spent approaching 20,000 hours. It's been a hobby as well as patient for me. That's great. Yes, there, there's a wealth of information out there around botanical medicine. And I'd like us today in our conversation also to clarify some aspects of that for maybe those Googlers out there that are Googling what to take for a specific ailment. But I love that you talked about one, your passion kind of shifting for longevity, which is so important for all our listeners out there. And I think that's not necessarily like the craze right now, but everybody's looking always right the cup of youth right? The fountain of youth, how we can really extend our lifespan. <laughs> and that ties in with my next door neighbor just died a few weeks ago at 98 years of age. Wow. And she had been on a couple of herbs that I'd recommended to her 25 years previously. I've also had two other individuals. One was a 73-year-old woman who was ready to die. She'd had vertebral compression fracture, got depressed. It gave her a final gift to the church and said, I'm ready to die. I said, Betty Ann, we're not ready for you to die yet. <laughs> and so I put her cordyceps to kind of lift her spirits. And it did. And in fact, her atrial fibrillation that she was having intermittently stopped for about a month. I was just giving her one twice a day at that point. And then I figured out well, I could boost the dose. And so I did boost up and instantly with cordyceps, always start low and build up over seven to 10 days because there's a stimulant that if you mm -hmm. have a coronary artery that's not even blocked, it might unmask that coronary artery blockage. Right, which would not be good. <laughs> up, no, so build up gradually in that way. And a lot of times it needs to be balanced. This is an herb for older individuals, 70 years old and up is where it really shines the most. So I bumped her up gradually to three twice a day. 
And she didn't have any more atrial fibrillation for 20 months after that. Her mood was boosted. Her vitality was boosted. She was all over town doing things. <laughs> Just dramatically changed her life. And that went on for years. And I'm convinced Ed added several years of her life expectancy. There was the 94-year-old Bernie who had been a member of our church. He had a rupture of a tendon supporting one of his heart valves. He was told if he didn't get surgery on his heart that he would die. I told him, Bert, if you get surgery, the anesthesia is going to kill off some of your brain cells. Might kill you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so he did. And he lived by himself for the next five years, mowing the line and doing everything. He went to his college reunion at 99, and he was the only one there, of course. And finally, at age 99, he did die. But he had five wonderful years. He, really the best five years he'd had in decades since mm -hmm. I'd known him. And so my next door neighbor, I had her on a combination of cordyceps with Rishi. He's particularly good. That combination is great for lung health. And she had some lung issues from smoking. And the cordyceps strengthens the muscles, the chest wall muscles, the diaphragm, improves oxygenation of the tissues by boosting the hemoglobin a little bit because of its testosterone action. And Rishi, really good for chronic bronchitis. So I use that combination a lot in chronic lung goes. And uh, you know, she's a woman who's had nine lives, did, <laughs> uh, 98 years of age, and her mind was still in great shape at that point. I mean, yeah, that, that can be some, what part of the body is going to go first, right? It's either the body <laughs> itself, the physical unit, or the brain. I think we're seeing that a lot with people in the, this longevity piece, like either their brain stops functioning and then they're like, okay, my body's still going along on its own, but now yeah. I don't remember anything like with early onset dementia and et cetera. And that's can be a challenging place place for people, I think. Yeah, cordyceps certainly can regenerate the liver, but re reportedly may regenerate kidney tissue and may mm. regenerate lung tissue. It's the only thing I'm aware of that potentially could have those aspects. And I tie that in with the fact that it boosts testosterone. Now, if you give testosterone cream to a male, their testicles shrink. They go on vacation, right? There's no right. <laughs> not anymore. But when cordyceps was given to mice, their testicles actually got larger. So it's working mm. by different mechanisms. Maybe you know, the hypothalamic pituitary angle and boosts testosterone by that mechanism. And what I find clinically is that testosterone is anabolic essentially to every organ and tissue in the body, mm, exactly. not a particular organ or tissue, not just muscles. And that includes the brain. I think the key is with cordyceps, again, it's not generally a good choice for younger individuals because it, it's really too strong for, for uh, <laughs> particularly young females. I start cordyceps, say, one a day or even one twice a day. A lot of times the patients will call and curse out the front office. They're just so agitated, irritable from the cordyceps. Right, can't sleep. Well, yes. where it comes from, right? It's a parasitic mushroom that goes after, kills these caterpillars. So it's a very aggressive botanical. Yeah, so I think that's a great way for us to start our conversation today because we're going to be talking all about botanicals, but such a wonderful segue, right? Because you explained just like a lot of different things about how cordyceps especially and reishi can also be used from that medicinal standpoint. Well, they're not, they're herbs, but they're also classified in different category, right? That medicinal mushroom category. So let's no. talk about what are some of the most effective botanicals for promoting overall health and wellness? And I know that's a huge question, but let's no. talk about like, how about your top three that you would say hands down, I know you just mentioned two, but hands down, you think these are the best for promoting. Let's focus on the brain today, because I think that's a big topic for a lot of our listeners. First, I'll start with the best overall botanical, which is turmeric. And I try mm. to put every single one of my patients so on good. turmeric. And turmeric certainly boosts brain growth. I point out is that lowers blood pressure, blood sugar, blood cholesterol, thins the blood, anti-inflammatory, gets toxins in the system, prevents gallstones, antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral. It also antidepressant, equivalent to Prozac, very typical depression, 180 cancer properties, and cancer identified, done improved improve the outcome, reverses amyloid plaque buildup in the brain, characteristic of Alzheimer's, and grows the brain by two mechanisms. So curcumin, 90 milligrams twice a day for 18 months, boosted memory 38%. And tumorone, which is not in curcumin, but in turmeric, can boost brain stem cell growth up to 80%. So turmeric mm. is foundational for all of our patients yes. with that. Blood is, mm. is the one that convinced me that herbs are not placebo. I went to right. Columbia University and heard the botanical experts up there speak. Richard Brown had just written a book, The Rhodiola Revolution. His wife had neural Lyme disease. They were both psychiatrists at Columbia. And she couldn't work as a psychology professor because of the neural Lyme. He searched the world over and finally in the Soviet Union discovered 
rhodiola, which grows at 11,000 feet in Siberia, look, uh, improved her brain quickly and she was back to work after that. And so I tried rhodiola and I take it essentially every work day now. And I have mm -hmm. for the last 17, 18 years. It works quickly. It works sometimes within 30 minutes, sometimes takes two to three days to see a full effect with it. It boosts all the neurotransmitters and particularly dopamine. So it works yes. like the prescription so drug, well, butrin, bupropion. Right. You don't want to use those two together. <laughs> right. Yes, this is true. And there's a lot of contraindications that can but go along with it. use rhodiola to help pull someone off of well, butrin. And I do that. Day. But rhodiola at the Soviet Union, they gave to college to First of all, the soldiers and Olympic athletes to improve their performance. And then they gave to college students the week before exams and during exams, and they scored one grade better than other students. <laughs> Dopamine growth, growth of prefrontal cortex, an IQ part of the brain. So it was made mm -hmm. smarter. So I gave it to my son his third year of law school, and he got academic honors for the first time. Yeah, <laughs> That's great. And he sailed through the bar. He was getting a little panicky. I put him on some other adaptogens along with that. And he mm -hmm. said, I did. I don't know what you gave me, but I wasn't panicky at all. And I just sailed right through. So mm. our, our rhodiola is, because it is so energizing, you have to be careful about who you give that to. If you're bipolar, they can make you manic. Certainly one, what's a caution, I'll say, you don't want to, there are other strategies you have to utilize to, if you are giving that to someone with bipolar. So Rule is I wouldn't give it unless you really know what you're doing. The second thing is you don't want to give this to a young, wired female. Wired, wired. and tired, that adrenal stage right. three. So it'll overdo it. Now, if you combine it, though, with another adaptogen, go to cola, which mm -hmm. is called relaxing, has a 12-hour GAB effect, then that combination can work out real well. Or you can use, I like to use it in females premenstrually or premenopausally in the second half of the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. For example, Vitex, I might start, X works just like progesterone. They're almost yep. identical in their effects. And I might start Vitex one twice a day on day eight and maybe somewhere between day eight, day 14, whenever you get anxious edgy is the role of Vitex. And then after a week or two, when that effect wears off, you can bump it up to two twice a day. And then say a few days prior to menses, bump it up to three twice a day. And it's mm -hmm. until about 48 hours, 80% of the time, that Vitex is going to eliminate those premenstrual symptoms. The anxiety, panic, obsessiveness, phobias, sleep, nerves, irritability, carbide, craving, well, breast soreness, tenderness, migraines, et cetera. Each of the time can eliminate all of those, but you still might get brain fog and rhodiola <laughs> treat the brain fog. And exactly. so <laughs> rhodiola with Vitex, you won't get the wired, the wired effect. Incidentally, it's a couple of cautions with Vitex and with progesterone, and that is it relaxes muscles and that includes in the throat. So, you mm -hmm. know, snoring, it can put you into sleep apnea. Interesting. So that's, and secondly, you remember that progesterone converts into cortisol. So exactly. I, yes, <laughs> important hormone there. <laughs> it can exasperate the yeast issues. So if you start getting irritable bowel, you might have some intestinal yeast you need to get cleared up. With those, and, and it doesn't work in everyone. You know, it it's normally calm and relaxing, but stimulating, I think it's converting into other hormones and estrogen or dihydrotestosterone. So you have my patient stop it if it's the Vitex is stimulating. And secondly, if you get breast soreness, it's converting into estrogen. In fact, and I think in those scenarios, it can be harmful and maybe increase risk of breast cancer. We're in normally 80% of the time, I think it reduces risk. Girl, so, yeah, that's great. <laughs> I think you covered some really good ones there using, I love that you talked about go to cola. It's one of my favorite. I even love the shape of the herb, which looks like the brain. And I love that when we have that similarity between the plant and its actual function, because it really helps us to be able to remember them myself. But I always like to show it to patients like, Hey, <laughs> this is what the real plant looks like. Not just in a bottle in a capsule form, just, just ginkgo, ginkgo biloba. Cause it has that same kind of like brain shape. Oh yes. This is going to help brain function. <laughs> <laughs> and go to cola. Almost no one has side effects of go to cola. Extremely it's such volatile. a great plan. So it's a good one to use in kids. Kids with ADHD. What mm -hmm. I find works really well is combining rhodiola with go to cola and the copa too. Mm -hmm. And the go to cola helps the fidgetiness, the restlessness. Mm -hmm. 
Radiation is terrific for ADHD and kids. I've used it 40, 50 times in that scenario and not had problems or issues with that. Mm -hmm. Just remember, I find with rhodiola, use it five days a week, stop it for two days because you do build up a tolerance in my experience. So mm -hmm. you don't want to take it continuously. And that's why in the menstrual cycle, I like to leave it off that first week. You don't have brain fog that first week. Your brain's mm -hmm. working well. In fact, when my patients come in with 25, 35 symptoms, I point out, all those symptoms are better the week after your period. All those symptoms are worse the week before your period. That's right. how the hormones are with this. So postpone the rhodiola to maybe day eight, and then I double up on it on day 15 and continue it until 48 hours after the period starts. Yeah, that's great. And I think when it comes to using herbs for the female cycle, it's really important to know that we can use different herbs for different times of month. Like just that you mentioned, you talked about Vitex and Vitex, I would love your point of view on this, but from what I've used, when I use it with patients, I always see that it takes a little bit longer to start to really take effect. And it's one of those slower acting herbs, as opposed to like you're talking about with rhodiola, where you can really feel the effects almost immediately when you take it. <laughs> Very good. A good point about the Vitex. And so go to cola. It's the brain food of the herbs, right? That's the way it's mm. described. It works pr probably by many different mechanisms to optimize brain health. So it's mm. one of the ways to grow your brain along with turmeric and vitamin D and mm. fish oil. And Boswellia is another one that I mm -hmm. use. My, there's so many different herbs that promote brain growth. And to be honest, you know, most days I take 160 supplement pills. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. That takes a lot of time. Each herb has hundreds, if not thousands of beneficial nutrients. It's like a vegetable. Instead of doing five vegetables a day, why not do a hundred vegetables a day? You get the benefit of all that. Now, you, there are a lot of ones I've tried and don't like and haven't helped. But over right. the last 20 years, you know, I've accrued all these and I try to come up with a reason not to take these. Once you understand what they do for you, it's hard not to take them in my right. experience. So true. And I love that you mentioned again, the go-to cola, you can even use it in salads, which is a great way to have, if you, and it's easy to grow. If you live in a warm climate, you can even have it in a hanging pot, like in your house and you just take some pieces off and mix it. It's a little bit bitter, but it's a great one. I love adding it to salad. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm promoting my brain health, increasing circulation, maybe even helping with some scar tissue healing all at the same time. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Because that's another particularly good attribute is that it breaks down fibrotic tissue tissue. And I've experienced that personally from go to cola. It may take six to 12 months to accomplish that, but it definitely works in brain. And it's the only other than taking maybe systemic enzymes like bromelain, which likewise maybe over a six to 12 month period might accomplish the same thing when taken on an empty stomach. But go to cola definitely is wonderful in that regard. And I might use it, for example, in interstitial fibrosis, mm -hmm. pulmonary fibrosis, maybe an area where that uh, help. But for most people, I think you go to the dentist, whenever you go to the doctor, whenever you go to the airport and have to go through TSA, that's a perfect time to do go to cola. <laughs> you know, one to two, go to cola. It's generally standardized with the dosing is what I generally recommend with my patients. Yes, that's great. And you've been talking about a lot of dosing in reference to capsules. Is that usually the way that you work in, with herbs themselves as opposed to like tinctures and an herbal right. tea? Can you talk yeah. about the differences between those and for our listeners to understand like the way that the effects of those work? Like one, how, what it takes when you take a capsule or a tablet going through the system as opposed to taking a tincture, liposomal, and also tea. Yeah. And you probably will have to help me out with this because I, my focus really is with capsules primarily. Tablets have a lot of binders, so I don't like right. binders. And one of the nice thing about capsules, if you have difficulty swallowing, you can always open the capsule and exactly. mix it with water and get it out. That's why I like to use capsules. Yeah, the liquids versions would work more rapidly. And so certainly there are indications, but I probably would let you handle that side of things. <laughs> I, I really don't use tinctures in my practice that much. And but there's nothing wrong with using the tinctures. It's just, right. that's what I found to be more convenient. Yeah, that's easy, an easy way. And they're great for the cap. I love that you talked about the digestive piece because being once that tablet with a lot of fillers has to go through the system, your body has to break it down. But in that capsulated form, it's so easy to just open the capsule up, like you mentioned, and you can even make your own capsules. You can buy the dried herb, buy the capsulator, which is super inexpensive and, the, and just fill it or just even the empty capsules and do it yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Botanicals uh, are transformative and there's so many wonderful ways to use them. Yes. So effective. I love that. So 
When we're talking about from that patient perspective, how can patients start incorporating more botanicals into their life, like their daily life and daily routine? I know you mentioned you take 160 supplements, which might not be realistic for every listener out there, but they're so powerful, right? How do you talk to your patients about really the power of botanicals and starting to use them daily? Because I think sometimes there's that piece where someone doesn't understand how they work. They might take longer to work and uh, as opposed to maybe a pharmaceutical. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Let me talk about turmeric first, because there is a powder form. You can get organic Mm -hmm. turmeric powder, and that's the most economical way to do it. Mm -hmm. If you're financially strapped, you certainly could go that route. And you could use theoretically as much as a tablespoon a day. That probably would be the maximum I would ever consider. And taste-wise, you're not likely to get to it. Right, pretty bitter. But you can mix it with coconut milk, get it down. It's called golden milk, and that's something my patients have taught me. Or you can cook with turmeric, certainly, as well. I think in India, classically, it's cooked with some oil, which helps with the absorption, likely. Mm -hmm. The researcher at Anderson who did all the research with turmeric, the claim was it's not well absorbed. His point was It's extremely well absorbed. And by the time they check blood levels, it's already in the cells. It's out of the bloodstream. (laughs) Super (laughs) absorbing. It may not be as big of an issue as it's made. Now, when you're using it in the powder form, you need to be, or put it in the smoothies, you need to be aware that it can stain your clothing. So that's probably the, the biggest caution with it. Again, it doesn't taste the best. So it's hard probably to comply with that on a daily basis, which is why I primarily recommend. I give patients the option, but they generally use the capsules. Yeah. Yeah. Turmeric is great. I think it's one of the easiest herbs to use in its multi-forms. Like you talked about using it in cooking. You can, I like to put it in juices. That's another really great one to use like little turmeric shots. It does (laughs) stain the teeth. I had my dentist last time I went asked me if I had been using a lot of it. I was like, oh yes. So I always recommend rinsing (laughs) if you're using a lot of it, uh, rinsing your mouth out in between uses to really get it in between out of the crevices of your teeth so it doesn't stain. (laughs) Sounds great. Yeah. And so with turmeric, when we're talking about using it as a way, how can patients then start using it more daily? If they're talking about using it, should they pick one particular system? Let's say for their interested in working on brain health, should they work on a particular system and then choose one herb to try out? Or do you recommend, what do you, what's your kind of go-to like, okay, try this herb, or you like to have more of a synergy and use a couple herbs together? Yeah, I generally put everyone ideally on turmeric in the <laughs> form of the first visit. Yeah. Uh, and I generally give it with meals. I think with turmeric, you can give it either with or without meals. I don't think it, it matters mm-hmm. that much with absorption. And I'm going to put in a personal plug. There's the Dr. Roach organic turmeric uh, capsules that we have available at our office. Nice. And you won't find, so you're welcome to contact my office. We even offer that wholesale if you want to buy a case with that. But I like to get the highest quality with my patients. And that's what I emphasize. If you get it off the store shelves in a, at a cheap store, those products come from China. That's the cheapest source. And if you notice, there's a lot of pollution in China. When it rains, those pollutants get in the soil and then mm. the plants absorb those nutrients. So you really don't want to get herbs from, from China. India can have issues as well. So quality... Yeah very important with that. But I will start one to two turmeric capsules with my patients, maybe with breakfast. Now, if they have joint issues, it's a good anti-inflammatory. It has COX-2 activity, just like ibuprofen. Mm-hmm. And the difference is that ibuprofen doubles risk of heart attack and triples risk of stroke. Right. Reduces risk of heart attacks and strokes. The turmeric you know, lowers cholesterol comparable to simvastatin, but statins cause a whole uh, wealth of side effects because oh, they lower totally. levels. Right, and they lower CoQ10 levels, which disrupts mitochondrial function. So not a single cell in your body works as well when you're on statin cholesterol medicine. But that doesn't mean stop your statin. But I would investigate other strategies. But I do, except for extreme cases, I do get patients off of statins and onto other products. Other uh, Boswellia is one I use a lot. I, Boswellia is a leukotriene antagonist, just like the drug Singular. It's a really good natural anti-allergy medicine. And It makes sense to me maybe to give Boswellia, say, 30 minutes for meals. We all have food sensitivity issues. And I wonder if the Boswellia might help to quell the degree of reaction when Mm. we might get to foods 
that we're sensitive to. So maybe 30 minutes before meals, if you you and I tend to be more OCD and do things very detailed, but <laughs> right. you don't have to do it three times a day, exactly 30 minutes before meals. But that's one way to, with its anti-allergy effects, it's good for asthma patients as well mm -hmm. as for allergies. It doesn't seem to hurt Jesus too much, it promotes learning and memory. Yes. And promotes branching of brain cells and rodents. It hits yeast and yeast biofilms, calming, relaxing, and its effects in anti-inflammatory to joints and to arteries. So mm -hmm. it's again, a wealth of benefits that ideally I'd want all of my patients getting Boswellia. Yeah, and Boswellia is the same as frankincense, correct? In the, but in the phrase, no, yeah, it's, so. It's just in an oral form and mm -hmm. certainly use frankincense essential oils if you want. For example, my patients with migraines, I might recommend that they put a drop on their finger and then on the roof of their mouth. And one third of the time, that'll get rid of the migraine within 10 minutes because the frankincense is wonderful for brain health mm -hmm. and inflammation, reduces swelling in the brain. We use it a lot in patients with brain tumors. It's terrific in that scenario. And of course, you can in inhale it. Or you can massage it with a carrier oil into the temples. You can diffuse it and breathe it into the lungs to help with you know, lung issues. So it's a terrific botanical. In fact, my wife is on three twice a day for uh, knee issues. Oh, so nice. I said she has well. knee issues, but I'm glad she's using <laughs> Boswellia. Uh, yeah, that's her favorite and, thing. Yeah, right. the Boswellia is great. And I think it's just a good compliment to turmeric, especially if someone I find mm. with patients, if like turmeric is just not quite their friend, sometimes Boswellia yeah. is a little more gentler. It's like more, I'm also like that more feminine piece. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And turmeric does have a few oxalates. And so if you go with big doses, you might get into oxalate trouble. It's just mm. one caution. I feel personally that oxalates may be responsible for like 40% of my patients' aches and pains. At some point, be happy to talk oxalates, but yeah. uh, organic acid testing, I use Great Plains Labs. Yeah, a that's a great one. Assess for oxalates, but uh, such a big issue. I had plantar fasciitis, had arthritis in my hands and with trigger finger for nine months. And I couldn't figure out why it was my spinach smoothie every day. I was eating an ounce of dark chocolate every afternoon. <laughs> I was eating blueberries too many some days. I was eating nuts every day. And those are all substantial sources of oxalates. I tell my patient, whenever you have a naked or pain, the first question is, well, what did I eat? And all <laughs> these things you don't suspect that are causing the issues. Yeah, that's such a great, important fact, because it's true. You can be eating something that's beneficial, but you could also be eating something that is triggering you, like you said, with that, like a trigger finger and with arthritis, because we can have things that we're, oh, we overdo it, <laughs> especially when we find out like, oh yes, this is going to be the cure all, right? Patients can take too much of something and we can too, it's super easy. So when we're talking about using botanicals, how do they compare? You mentioned a couple things, but how do they compare to taking that prescription medication? Of course, I have my opinion all about that, but I'd love for you to talk, especially in relationship to cancer patients, because I know that you do a lot of work with that particular modality or that particular population. And how do you find that comparison and how do you work with the cancer patients in that particular way? Well, first of all, I think understanding that prescription medicine always cause side effects is the first thing. <laughs> right. <do>. Number one. <laughs> fact, it's my belief, and it's not just my belief, there's a book written by interventional cardiologist in Chattanooga, Dr. James Markham. I think it's medicines that kill. And he pointed out it's the number one cause of death in America. And he's not the first one to point that out. Gary Nell and Life Extension Magazine did a nice piece also pointing that out. And individuals like myself, I've been practicing medicine for what, 41 years. <laughs> and so I've seen the effects of you. Side effects are much greater than what you know most physicians realize. Right. Right. So I try to, the first 20 years, I put patients on more and more medicines to get them better. In the last 20 years, I've been pulling them off. <laughs> They're doing so much better off the prescription medicines. Now, botanicals have effects. I think this is the way to think about it. botanicals. If you if you're, have constipation, then you may want to avoid botanicals that help with diarrhea. Boswellia dampens a little bit, for example. Bacoba may dampen diarrhea a little bit. But if you're constipated, you might need to be a little bit cautious about that. So they're not really so much side effects, though it's possible to get allergic reactions. But it's more that they have effects and understanding what those effects are for a particular herb. Donny Yance suggested that a good herbalist knows a hundred different effects from any given herb. <laughs> <laughs> Quite to that level, but... 
Yeah, that's a lot. And that's a, I think that's a great synopsis or a summary, I guess is a better word for the power of herbal medicine botanicals. Because I think when thing, people think about an herb in the particular, like lay person, like this herb is for this, right? But then when I talk to patients, I'm like, actually, maybe that's its primary. It's like claim to fame. But there's actually so many other benefits for herbs. And I think that's one of the reasons why I think they hands down are better than any prescription medicine. Of course, like you mentioned, side effects. And I find too with patients that, that I see that usually come in with to see me with 15 or 20 medications that they're on and wanting help to come off of them in some particular way is that it's a, the total accumulation of all of those prescriptions together and the side of it's just like they're working together and the side effects just become so massive because their body just I think it's so overloaded and they'll take this for that or take this for that and it can be the same way for herbs right you want to use them with caution in their multiplication of levels <laughs> I can say this since I'm a physician I can say physicians have lost sight of the definition of polypharmacy right you know, they have <laughs> our prescriptions are more is bad medicine and, mm -hmm. and how many patients are on eight to ten 12 different prescription medicines mm -hmm. proven to increase risk of death and disease. Polypharmacy, very important to keep in mind. If you're having to be on that many prescriptions, the, sun, the root issues are not being addressed with that. Exactly. You know, as, as a rule, don't work as fast. They're generally not as powerful as prescription medicines, but they're much, much safer. How many people have died from botanicals, from vitamins, from minerals? It, that's looked at year after year. The poison control folks do that research in anywhere from zero to one. <laughs> Woohoo, those are big years. numbers. <laughs> but if you look, it's readily acknowledged that with prescription drugs, at least 125,000 die each year from prescriptions. And the reality is it's closer to probably 500,000. Just because uh, it's not documented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. From the, for example, kidney failure that's not recognized uh, from side effects of many different prescription medicines. In my cancer patients, and yeah, that's a big focus of what I do. I treat cancer patients from particularly the eastern half of America. Uh, and I'd want to put patients on a hundred different botanicals. It's not feasible to do that. So I use combination <laughs> products that maybe have 12 different botanicals in them. I use the three top botanical products that I use. One has turmeric, curcumin, resveratrol, decaffeinated green tea, black cumin seed, and that a second and several others, ginger. And, and the second product has a highly concentrated form of Boswellia with feverfew, with Magnolia honocal, and with bromelain. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is more mushroom-based, focused on the liver that has reishi, has turkey tail in it, for example, as the primary ingredients with that. So I put all of my cancer patients on those combination products. I can pick and choose between, depending on the type of cancer they have, as far as additional botanicals. That right. That you can do right off the bat. I use a product that has resveratrol, CoQ10, alphapoic. That's not so much a botanical, the resveratrol. And then terostilbe. Terostilbe and a cousin of resveratrol has actually 100 any tumor properties. There about 35. Yeah, and turmeric maybe has 100 as well. The, and, and when you're using it with chemotherapy, it's gotten a bad rap in combination with chemotherapy because not everyone knows how to use botanicals in combination. Yeah, there are a few that you want to stay away from in combination, but most of the time, if you're treating with chemotherapy, it kills the tumor cells. Some are half dead, but then of course it tries to mutate away. And if you give something like turmeric that hits at 100 different markers, you're blocking the exit so mm. that the cells have no direction to mutate. I have a patient currently who's finished her 11th chemotherapy, different type of chemotherapy. Normally after the second or third chemotherapy, it stops working. But because of the botanicals and the other strategies we utilize, she you deliver at her, you couldn't tell she has cancer. And that's the other thing. The botanicals improve your quality of life. Some patients feel better than they've had uh, <laughs> 10 or more years of cancer because of these root issues being addressed with that. So then the, there also is something called Artemis that's a particularly one that I use in my more advanced tumor scenarios and find that's very helpful. That follows iron into tumor cells and kills them. Yes, so, a good plant there. But there's a certain way you can't give Artemis continuously. And there's a study currently at a local university where they're giving it continuously as a tea and it won't work. I called the head of the study and point pointed that out because your liver quickly figures out how to metabolize it. So with Artemis, you have to do it one week on, one week off mm -hmm. for it to be effective. You use it continuously. It will not work as, as far as having anti-tumor activity. Interesting. Yeah. It's a very strong plant.
Yeah, a very potent tool. Lymphomas, mm -hmm. liver tumors, really is any estrogen related tumor. Uh, Artemis is particularly good in those settings. And it usually makes a substantial difference. That's great information because it's so important, I think. And I like what you said too, about when a patient is on chemotherapy or radiation, particularly those herbs can be really helpful. And why do you think that there's such a, a block about helping patients or during that time period? It's, I feel like everything is being healed in the body. They need the most support from us when it comes from the herbal kingdom. And then they get the message from their oncologist, whatever you don't take anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Well, into this. What you're not up on, you're down on. Okay. Right. That's what it boils down to. It's just as simple as that. The doctors are in the defensive mode, the defensive mindset. They're worried about being sued. Now I've had 85 patients with spiritual near-death experiences, 800 <clears throat> with transformative spiritual events. And I, at this point, I'm hundred percent certain about a creator for all of us, right? A benign, powerful creator. And once you get that understanding, then I realize I'm working for God. I'm not working for the lawyers or for others. And right. as long as God and I are getting along okay in this <laughs> scenario, I don't care what the oncologists say. I don't care what others say. And then the proof is in the fruit. These patients do better. And after a while, the oncologists recognize that their patients are doing better. Right. Year, and then the things start changing at that point. But with managing cancer, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Just fasting for 24 hours prior to chemotherapy, for example, reduces side effects by a half. Mm -hmm. It costs a penny to do. And so just teaching patients these simple strategies can make profound differences. Oh, yes, totally. And I think that's the piece that's missing out of the oncology realm is all the pieces that can be. Say mm -hmm. real quickly with this too, I'm sorry, is that circulation is critical. So the number one thing in, in cancer, first of all, is peacefulness. And that most patients, of course, are not peaceful, particularly if they've been to their oncologists and not at peace. For example, if you plant tumors into mice, a breast tumor into mice, and you stress the mice, there's a 30-fold increase in metastasis. But wow, that's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And if you get the drug propranolol that blocks adrenaline, that prevents most of those metastases. So the number one thing is peacefulness 24-7, which Relax. is why <laughs> And number two is circulation because of a fourfold higher risk of a heart attack or stroke. So it's critical to check the dimer fibrinogen levels and get patients on systemic enzymes between on empty stomachs to help get that circulation protected. And I've treated hundreds and hundreds of cancer patients over the last 17, 18 years, I've not had a single one to my recollection with a heart attack or stroke, but ones that have ignored what I've done, one had a massive stroke, one died from a heart attack a month later, another developed horrific thrombophlebitis. So circulation is so important. Yes. And it helps everything circulate to get the toxins out of the system too, as soon as possible. They're doing their quote unquote job. But uh, and I, I wrote a book on that topic that you're oh, welcome. Yeah. Yeah, Vital Strategies in Cancer. I, it may still be the most comprehensive book. It was recommended by Dr. Mark Hyman. So I was glad to get his endorsement with the book. Donnie Yance, the top singer, was an expert. It's a wonderful book. It's encyclopedic, but it's written in an easily read manner. So that's well, great. On Amazon or through our office. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes for everybody that's tuning in today. And you mentioned a piece that I'd love us to go back to. So you talked about like transformative spiritual events and how can you share a couple examples of those that have been like linked to specific, specifically like to nutrients and botanicals it, in that, I don't know if that falls in that category, but I was thinking about that today as I was getting ready for our conversation. If you had some memories of any of that from your experiences. I'm not sure that... Off the top of my head, I can't think of specific instances of that, but this has transformed my life and my practice. When I first, that first patient who had a car accident and they were out of body and they were in ultimate bliss, and then they became very mission oriented when they get very mad, they didn't want to come back. They don't said, make me come back. back. <laughs> they don't want to come back. And so here, a woman didn't care whether she died or not. And I thought, I've been training all these years, all this clinical experience to save your life and you don't care whether you live or not. <laughs> You're like, wait, what have I been doing? <laughs> but that's so critical to share to cancer patients. I point out, li listen, if you know, all my recommendations are wrong, everything you do is wrong. The downside is ultimate bliss, right? So you're going to be fine. I'm working for your family. They want to keep you around. But right. you're gonna, if you're giving love to the world, you're going to be in great shape. Now, if you're not giving love to the world, you might have a life review of death. And that is a highly emotionally charged experience <laughs> where you think, oh, I may 
better do things a little differently on this side of the veil. Right. Uh, but yeah, botanicals. Now, I will mention that certainly psychedelics are an area of uh, ketamine at the moment is a legal psychedelic that you can get intravenously. It's been legal right. since 2019. And I had a cancer patient, the same one I mentioned with 11th chemotherapy. She had severe neuropathy mm. and decided, was told you, she could get IV ketamine for that. But she knew she was going to have a spiritual experience doing that. <laughs> so she had all these questions for God and she actually got very profound answers. Oh, wow. That's great. From that. And that's uh, in my latest book, Brilliance, I share her story. You would really enjoy reading the few pages of her conversation. <laughs> oh, yes. That sounds wonderful. And tell us about your book because I want to make sure we have time to talk about it. So you have a couple books, but your newest book is called Brilliance. And tell us a little bit about that, what it's about, and walk us through your inspiration for writing the book? Yeah, so uh, when I was at Duke back in 1970, I guess it was 1970, a few years ago, <laughs> I, I was getting depressed that winter. I wrote a poem about being depressed. Now, when I died, nothing, you know, I'm just deteriorated into dust and fly off into the wind. At this point, I know, you know, exactly opposite of that. But I, I experienced the wintertime blues and if I had a little bit of that, that's why I, currently I'm not at my office. <laughs> and, uh, at the beach. Are you at the beach? <laughs> I see the background there. <laughs> that might be a little bit of a clue about that. And then I was told by someone who's read some children's books, he said, you need to write a book on depression. Mm. And then a few months later, you know, I agreed. I said, yeah, you're probably right. He said the same thing. And I sensed he's an intuitive guy, married an intuitive woman. And I sensed that this was an intuitive message that, and I felt, yes, I can write a book on that. But as I got into it, I've had so much success in managing different brain disorders from ADHD to, mm. uh, to Parkinson's to even autism. I've had seen a dramatic turnaround in that scenario. So I expanded the book into that as well. So it, the book is basically, it's brilliance, the pursuit of hope, wisdom, and the divine. And it's basically optimal mood, optimal brain, and then optimal divinity is the mm. way to think of the book, the three sections of that. So the first section I point out, don't take pharmaceuticals unless you absolutely have to. Number one. <laughs> I go into very comprehensive vitamins, minerals, amino acids, nutrients, botanicals to optimize brain health and a lot of detailed information there. Get into some counseling aspects and then get into some of the paranormal stories my patients have shared which I think the audience finds very fascinating. I talk about psychedelics, what the research is suggesting there, how promising those are. And then a chapter toward the end of the book, I share, I've had some interesting experiences myself. For example, I had a woman who had three near-death experiences show up at my office as a new patient originally, and she came back a month later and said, told my wife reception, she said, I've got to see Dr. Roach. And she said, well, he's booked for months out. And he said, no, you don't understand. We've got to see him. So well, <laughs> you're going to think I'm crazy. She said she was from like Colorado and got this vision of a college on the hill and the word Ashland. And so she didn't know what the riddle meant, but she knew she had to solve it. The more dear death experiences you have, the more intuitive. And she's in that category. She went to Ashland, Oregon to try to find answers and couldn't find answers there and came to my office and found a college on the edge of hill outside of town and then did a YouTube search of me and Ashland, Oregon, Madeira Foundation. Figured I connected the dots. And she said, this conference you're having next month at Midway University is supposed to happen. It's, that was her message. That conference is supposed to happen. Now, the thing is, I had not told anyone, not even my wife, where the conference was going to be. How did she know where the conference was going to be? That doesn't sound like a very powerful message, but she said it is because it caused my husband and I to move from Colorado to Central Kentucky to come to your <laughs> office to share that message about that wow. 10 years ago. And we've had a conference ever since then. And it was a very special conference and a very special message that I got because at that point, I'd only signed up two to three people. And I just decided a few weeks ago prior to have the conference, I was going to have it a month later. And we only ended up having four to five people. So that's why that message particularly applied. But it was a very special conference. And then we've expanded it since then. And it's been transformative. But in chapter 14 of my book, I share a trance-like experience where my soul spoke to me. Mm -hmm. A traumatic event, which I knew somewhat about, but it went into some details I had no recollection of. And then also during that trance-like event, I had communication from a friend from the other side, a shaman, who had given me some very worthwhile advice. He named me Imhotep when he wrote oracles. Yeah. Uh, 
to physician, 3,000 years of PC. Getting a message from him from the other side was was so meaningful to me personally. His book has a lot of amazing stories in it. One of the near-death experiences, the individual was going up a marble pathway, and at the end of the marble pathway were three aliens. They said, we've been monitoring you through your life. It's not your time. You have to go back. They showed up later <laughs> in his dreams and said, you have to go. He lived in Colorado. You have to go to Virginia. There's something special there. And he drove all over Virginia. Finally, he found out what they were Told me, wanted him to find out and that when you read the book you'll find the answer oh gosh <laughs> I, gotta, I don't want to read it already now i have to spoiler <laughs> alert no you got to read it <laughs> that's great your book sounds as fascinating and i like all the different pieces it's kind of like similar to my book and where all these pieces like come together because i think that's the, really the medicine of where we are in the present and moving into the future right it's this holistic model where it's not just and we talked a lot about botanicals today but all the pieces right that mindset piece the spiritual piece the emotional piece the mental the physical the bodies need all that health related aspect to really be whole and to be healing ourselves <laughs> and actually you know what i've finally figured out after all these years is that Everything I've learned in the integrative settings, the botanicals and everything else is just a way to get patients in so that I can reach them spiritually. Exactly. That's all that matters is relax. You're going to be fine. There is life after life and it's blissful and wonderful. There are lessons you might have to learn. You might have to. So that gives me opportunity to connect spiritually. And if I can achieve that with those patients, then that's what really works. So it just gives me a buy-in, a way to get them into the office. So I really <laughs> treat the important thing. Right. Yes, everyone listening, we do have a ulterior mo motive, both of us, right? <laughs> Getting you through the door, but helping you with that spiritual aspect, which I think is so important for that piece of healing for patients. And that's where I really see the most profound steps in their healing journey, right? When they really look at themselves fully from that spiritual microscope, right? How are they living their spiritual life? What are they doing in their life to enrich not only their own life, but their community, their ever larging community around them. And something I really want to mention as well, I gave a presentation to the International Association of Near-Death Studies in Salt Lake City back in September on the God gene. Oh yeah, I wanted to talk about this. <laughs> Yeah, most of my patients are individuals that have, in essence, CLMT gene mutations. All right, half of us have CLMT heterozygous and maybe 15% homozygous. But that's a really key mutation that can mm -hmm. break down the neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine. And so these individuals, and you and I are in this category, incidentally, if you ever <laughs> figure this out, we have a good on switch, but not a good off switch. Anxiety, panic, obsessiveness, that's why we're so good. We're really detailed, workaholics, cross the T's, dot the I's, very thorough with what we do. But uh, we don't metabolize estrogen metabolites as well. So we become estrogen dominant associated with that. We don't get rid of toxins as effectively. So high risk of chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. But yeah, anxiety, panic, obsessiveness, phobia, sleep, disturbance, irritability, carbide, cravings, only breast disorders, centers, migraines, heavy periods, cramping, bloating, brain fog, aches and pains, and joints and muscles. And again, all those are worse that last week for your period, and all those are better the week. So hormones are very powerful in this. And yes. since you won't get rid of estrogen metabolites, then sex hormone binding globulin kicks in by the liver, and that lowers your available testosterone. So most of the individuals, high estrogen, low testosterone. 80% of the population now, excess estrogen, low testosterone because of processed foods, because of xenoestrogens, because yep. of fat, liver, testosterone, estrogen. So we're all just about estrogen dominant. And with a CMT gene mutation, if you're homozygous, you're in fight or flight every single day of your life. These women have not had a peaceful day their whole life. They don't oh, rest and digest, no break. And obviously that's hard on the adrenals. And so they're susceptible to chronic issues and estrogen promotes autoimmune disorders, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, classically with lupus, but really with all estrogen disorders. So if you have thyroiditis, guess what? You're estrogen dominant. Yeah. If you have gallbladder disease, guess what? You're estrogen dominant associated with this. So you can label those other 25 symptoms that those individuals have. And so it's critical. They can't metabolize adrenaline. So growing up, if they experience trauma and if being estrogen dominant, they're going to, women are going to develop prematurely and that'll attract negative energy into their lives. They experience trauma and their adrenaline kicks in. Guess what? They can't metabolize it. That's PTSD. So mm -hmm. I emphasize with these women, the religion I'm part of forgiveness isn't an option. In order to be forgiven, we have to forgive. First of all, ourselves 
and then forgive others, not a level of forgive you, but you're still a jerk, but a level of grace where if I grow me shoes, I might understand how that might have happened. And forgiveness is so huge for so many of us and cancer patients, but really with all these patients. So I tried to do that with all my new patients. So the other characteristics though, we know about the baggage, the fight or flight, the on switch and poor off switch, but these individuals are intuitive. They can stand next to you and know a lot more about you than you would ever mm. want them to know. <laughs> you know right. They connect in to God. If they're homozygous, they may have known about the creator from maybe the day they were born. It's not a faith in a higher virus. It's like they shook hands with the creator. So they have that div divine knowledge and those intuitive abilities, but also they're sensitive across the board. So sensitive in those positive ways, but uh, very caring. In fact, over caring and deplete themselves from mm. uh, have any resentment from that, but in their impasse because their sensitivity. So I counsel them to steer clear of negative energy, but sensitive to foods, to chemicals, to maybe noise and light, sensitive to mold, to electromagnetic fields. If you get a deer tick bite, to Lyme disease, all those are going to be magnified as well, tied mm. in with it. So the key is really balancing those hormones, getting estrogen down and getting testosterone up. Now, there's some polycystic ovarian women. You want to be cautious with them. <laughs> right. That's what vitamin D does. That's what fish oil does. That's what zinc does. That's what turmeric does, with spiritual, selenium, quercetin, vitamin B2, even green tea. All those modulate hormones in a favor way. They boost testosterone, block estrogen, so they're going to always help autoimmune conditions. I hydro testosterone to protect against that acne and aggressiveness and male pattern hair loss and hair growth in unwanted places. Modulating hormones with those nutrients is how they're so powerful in getting us healthier. That was so fascinating. I just love that you did all that that you just talked about, especially with the comp gene, the COMT gene. You know, I see, of course, I do a lot of work with patients in epigenetics and genetic testing. And I'm always amazed how many of my patients have mutations or SNPs of the comp gene. Like I would say probably 95% of my patients, of course, my population is the ones who get sick. Yes. And then that's, that's the female population the, mostly that I see. <laughs> and the nutrients, you know, that are helpful there. Magnesium is important. Sanamine, mm -hmm. yes, some cyanide helps break down adrenaline, which yep. is why. So if you have an empty HR, FR issue and can't generate SAMe, then you're not going to break down the adrenaline from the COMT. So they tie in together. And then the dream pathway is really critical as well. It's the transsulfuration pathway, CBS pathway from homocysteine to glutathione. Mm -hmm. That's functional B6 deficiency if you're not dreaming every night. Right. That's one of the best ways to characterize that. So I ask my patients in the first visit, are you dreaming every night? If not, they have a functional vitamin B6 deficiency. I get them on pyridoxin 5-phosphate, build up to as much as 200 milligrams. And 80% of the time that will get them dreaming. And mm. that converts glutamate, like cytotoxin, like into GABA. Which is so key for, the, for brain health and for calming the so, nervous yeah. system. All these mechanisms... Excess estrogen tied in with overstimulation. And so I take some natural lithium, lithium ortate. I do two, mm -hmm. two capsules on Sunday night. Almost nothing gets my adrenaline up on Mondays. And then that has one <laughs> to carry over. And I do the other third capsule on Wednesday nights because I'm off Wednesdays. And that keeps me at peace 24-7 all week long. <laughs> the other hundred plus. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's okay. You know that Monday is going to be head on. So if you want to lithium prep grows yourself. The brain. Lithium grows the brain, it's anti-herpetic as well, and it detoxes the brain. So it has a lot of beneficial effects associated with it. And we're not talking prescription. We're talking about the one Mother Nature did reject, the natural <laughs> lithium and lower doses. Right. Yes. I like to use the homeopathic form of lithium too. I found that's really helpful for patients as well. And it's can, sometimes I find that they can be sensitive to lithium. And so having that homeopathic form, it's like much more of it, like a gentler way to help. With yeah, I always piece. started a tiny dose with lithium. I had one patient on an eighth of a capsule who got angry for an hour. So, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> It is syncretic. You can't always predict. So true. So as we're wrapping up some things today, Dr. Roach, can you, I'd like you to share if there's any special stories that you might've had. Now you mentioned so many things today about someone particularly who has experienced like a profound health improvement through the use of botanicals, like the person that likes really stand out. You mentioned so many things today. <laughs> Where do I begin with that? For example, I had a patient who had been to Mayo Clinic. I think she'd been to Cleveland Clinic. I'd been to seven neurologists altogether, diagnosed with atypical Parkinson's, and mm. no one could help her. And when she came to our office, she was in a wheelchair and was just rotating her head slowly like that, and just would word would slowly flow out of her mouth. I thought she was quite cognitively impaired, was my impression with her. But I like to do comprehensive testing, very important. 
And we discovered that she was high in mercury, for one thing. Her homocysteine level, oh, was, wow. high. Mm -hmm. level was undetectable. So particularly addressing those three things. So after about six weeks, her head had stopped rotating. And after another six weeks or so, she was out of her wheelchair 80% of the time. So it's so critical to be comprehensive and look. I find if you look under rocks, you find answers. But if you don't look under the rocks, you won't find the answers. You That's right. To. Look under the rock. That's our yeah. key so, for today. <laughs> be doing lots of different assessment. And there's so many wonderful tests available. But so issues are not caused by one or two or three things. They're caused by 20, 30, 50. And the more those you address, the better the outcomes. But that was amazing to see her response with that. Also with an autistic child, four years of age, I couldn't get within five feet without her shrieking. She couldn't comprehend anything. She couldn't communicate at all. And I got her on supplements and a diet program. And she was about 50-50 with diet, but she was excellent with supplements. And the other thing she did was hyperbaric oxygen. We did treatments and they did it for a month regularly. And then they bought their own hyperbaric chamber. She came back a year and a half later. She's mainstreamed in school, the calmest of all her siblings. She was on her iPad. Just a dramatic turnaround mm -hmm. just with those simple interventions. Wow, that's so great. I love it. And the roundedness of those stories too, seeing how... I think when someone is we been to so many different aspects of their quote unquote healthcare team, right? And they're told like there's nothing that we can do. And then when they're coming to see an integrative physician like ourselves, the testing piece you mentioned is so important. We want to make sure we're looking at all the different aspects of the root cause. And when I, patients ask me, why are we doing all this testing? I'm like, because I want to make sure that I'm not missing something. Yeah, yeah you're complex so, and you yeah. didn't get this way overnight. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're not like looking under the rocks. Like you mentioned the organic acids test earlier and heavy metals, mold testing, all those pieces that kind of have have such huge effects on our cellular function. Yeah, an example with mold, we, I had an adolescent kid who came in with dyslexia and you know, behavioral issues. He was writing backwards. And so I just happened to mention mold when I was talking to him. They went home and found black mold because they bought uh -oh. this <laughs> from a bank just a month or two earlier, probably mm -hmm. the onset of issues. So they called frankly, what do I do? So get him out of the house. They seemed to grandma's and just in one or two months, all of his dyslexia, he was writing forwards again. And I had a Tourette's case, blah, 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 nonstop. Mm -hmm. And up front, the office the reception saying, why is he here? What does he think we can do? But I was in the back kind of solving. It's a great case. I can't wait. <laughs> You're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he had, he had a cow on his belt. So that was a clue. He was milk product sensitivities. I think he was sensitive to beef as well. His homocysteine level was really high with that. And I think he had some mercury issues too. Addressing those issues that fixed his problem with the Tourette. Mm -hmm. It's so neat to look under. I hate sore throats and earaches, right? That's I don't want what other doctors can't fix. That that's what gives me a thrill. Exactly. That's what makes us excited, listeners out there. So if you have that hard to figure out case, we're here to help you because I think that's where integrative medicine and especially botanical medicine really plays such an important role in nurturing the being. That's what I love about botanical medicine. It's just like they're they've been plants have been around for so long on our planet and used in so many thousands of different ways and different cultures around the world. And there's a reason. <laughs> it's a medicine that's worked for so long. It's been forgotten. And I think now we're really like, okay, we got to bring this back in. We have to really start reintegrating it into our healthcare in a way that really helps support families and friends and communities to finally feel amazing, feel healthy. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Dr. Roach, as we're wrapping up today, I have one last question and then we're going to give all the aspects of how people can find you and all that good stuff. If you had an unlimited budget, what would you do right now to make the biggest impact on the planet? I would, two answers. Number one, I would want to lobby to get botanicals replacing prescription medicine, get, getting natural approaches to thoroughly replace pharmaceuticals. I think we can, for the coming decades, if we did dedicated research, we could eliminate 90, 95% of prescription medicines. The health of the world would be so much better. But a bigger issue is spirituality mm -hmm. and the message out of there's one creator. And then when we die, we're going to experience bliss. We don't need to worry. Worry is unnecessary. And, <laughs> and, and, and so I would want to 
encourage individuals to read as much as they can in the area of near-death experiences. Watch YouTubes with near-death experiences. That's a great way to get started down this area. And it le leads down a rabbit hole where you get curious and learn. I'm looking at UFOs now and learning so much more of that direction. There's a limitless amount of information. So I'd encourage really just explore. Don't, don't live in that box. Go outside that box to learn. There's so much knowledge out there. And the more you truly learn, then the more relaxed you can be and the more you can appreciate how wonderful it is to be on earth at this time, how terrific it is. And even that you're special because you made it here to earth, your soul is here because you had to beat out some other souls to maybe to arrive here. Yeah. Enjoy this life to the fullest to make the biggest positive impression on the world. Just smile at everyone, right? Don't judge anyone. Justice is important. J-U-S-T-S-E-E. -E. Justice needs to apply. But we need to be giving love and smiles to the world. Yes. Oh, that's great. I love both of those topics, <laughs> of <laughs> course. <laughs> so yes, I think those are great ones to start implementing right away into our world of manifestation, right? Or manifestation box, <laughs> which is getting bigger every moment. So tell us how, tell our listeners how they can find you, what websites, you have a couple websites, and then also how they can find you on Facebook. And then also tell us about the offer that you're giving listeners about when they order the Brilliance book. Sure. Okay. So I've written three books. The first one, God's House Calls, shares over 200 stories, spiritual near-death experiences, transformative spiritual events like premonitions, intuitions, out of body experiences, voices, visions, dreams with meaning. And then my second book, Vital Strategies and Cancer. And then my most recent book, Brilliance, are the three books that are available. If you contact my office and you can do that through my websites, themidwaycenter.com is one, themidwaycenter.com. And then drroach.net is another site, d-r-o-a-c-h.net. And in fact, I have annual conferences, as you heard. So you're welcome to come join me in my conference where I teach everything I know over about a two and a half day period of time. So those are the two websites you can get on Facebook, James Roach or Dr. Jim Roach are the two Facebook sites, and I put some information on there periodically. Uh, <laughs> so you're welcome to uh, connect in there. But yeah, if you uh, if you request through the website to get my book Brilliance, we can give you a copy of God's House Calls, which is normally $19.99 at no charge. So you get two books for the cost of just purchasing Brilliance. And if you don't believe in a higher power, either one of those books, if you read those and you're open-minded, you will absolutely know for certain that there's a higher divine powerfulness that is there loving us every moment of every day. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, we'll put all of those links in the show notes. So everyone listening, don't worry. They're going to be right there for you. And you can always reach out to myself and I can connect you more with Dr. Roach if you need to get in touch with him. And so thank you so much for joining us today. I really loved our conversation, of course, about botanical medicine, Dr. Roach. It was just fascinating. All right. I really appreciate the invitation and thanks so much for the work you're doing. You're at the cutting edge of this. If I were 30, 40 years younger, I wish I'd started down this pathway at your age instead of 50 years of age. But you're doing such amazing work. It doesn't matter. Like you said, it's longevity in the very beginning of our conversation. It's all about what we're doing in the moment. And you're probably going to live to way past a lot of other people. But you know, it's my 71st birthday. Congratulations. That's amazing. I love that. So cheers to many more birthdays. <laughs>